And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And wherever you are in the world, welcome. And welcome back to another video chat I am having with various authors who contributed a chapter to my forthcoming edited book on a brief history of economic thought from the mercantilists to the post Keynesians, which is forthcoming in 2022 and published by Edward Elgar. With this book, I wanted to do something a little bit different. So in addition to publishing the actual book, um, I wanted to do a series of, of a dozen or so video chats where I sit down with uh, each author of the book to discuss the salient arguments of their respective contributions and to have a general discussion over the history of economic thought. I do believe this is the first time something like this is done. Now, this book is intended for an undergraduate audience, and I'm hoping that these 10 to 15 minute video chats will be used as a pedagogical tool. Uh, faculty can assign both the chapter and the corresponding videos to students. Today's guest is none other uh, than my friend Sergio Rossi, a longtime collaborator, co-author, co-editor of several books. In fact, I I looked up the number of books we co-edited together and I counted 10, uh, but I'm suspecting there's probably a few more. Um, and of course, I have to mention among those 10 books, two encyclopedias. The next encyclopedia will be coming out sometime this year, which is the Encyclopedia of Post-Keynesian Economics. Sergio Rossi is a full professor of economics at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland where he holds the Chair of Macroeconomics and Monetary Economics since 2005. He has a first PhD degree in economics of the, from the University of Fribourg in 1996, and a second PhD degree in economics at the University College London in 2000. His research interests are in macroeconomic analysis, particularly pertaining to national as well as international monetary and financial issues. He has authored or edited about 25 books, including uh, the, the above mentioned Encyclopedia of post Keynesian and Economics, as well as the Encyclopedia of Central Banking. He has published widely in academic journals and is frequently invited to TV talk shows discussing contemporary macroeconomic issues, both at national and international levels. He is a member of the editorial board of Cogent Economics and Finance, International Journal of Monetary Economics and Finance and the Review of Political Economy. Since 2015, he has been featuring, um, he has been featured on the list of the most prominent economists in Switzerland. Sergio, welcome, and thank you for contributing a chapter to the book and for sitting down with me today. Thank you, Louis Philippe. It's a pleasure for me. A pleasure is mine, I assure you. Uh, so your chapter is on Milton Friedman and the monetarists. Let's begin with the most obvious question. Who was Milton Friedman and how important an economist was he? Milton Friedman was born in 1912 and he died in 2006. He was an American economist and he was one of the founder of the so-called Chicago School of Economics, also called monetarism. And he was also the professor of a number of then prominent economists, among them Gary Becker, for instance, or Robert Lucas. Freeman himself was given the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics in, uh, for his work about uh, consumption theory, about monetary economics, in particular monetary policy, and also about uh, fiscal policy. I think he, he was a major contributor in economic analysis and also in economic policy decision making, especially in, in the United States and in Europe in the 1970s, 1980s, and since then, uh, a kind of uh, monetary mark 2.0 has emerged, so-called new classical economics, which is now the so-called new consensus macroeconomics among central bankers, but also as regards academicians, namely economics professors. Thank you. Um, in what way, uh, see, in, in my view, um, everything that was published after Keynes, after 1936, was a way of either challenging Keynes or supporting Keynes. In what way did Friedman uh, contest Keynes? I think uh, in several ways, both on economic theory and as regards economic policy, and on both kinds of grounds. 
as regards economic theory, I think one major point is the nature of money. Friedman said that money matters, but he then elaborated a theory, a monetary theory, whereby money is neutral in the sense that monetary magnitudes, like the so-called money supply, can only affect other monetary variables, like the price level. And in particular, in this regard, uh, against, free, against Keynes, Friedman argued that there is a causality relationship between the money supply and the price level, namely the former it gives rise to the latter. If you double the money supply, according to Friedman, you eventually double the price level, whereby Keynes or Keynesian economics would say the opposite. Money is an endogenous magnitude as a result of which uh, the money supply might increase, but this results from the credit mechanism, and in particular, the relationship between money and prices is reversed. If there is a higher price level, we need more money units, thereby an increase in the price level gives rise to an increase in the money supply and not the opposite, as Friedman said. As regards economic policy decisions, Friedman is well known for arguing that central banks should become independent of governments and also should target only price stability, especially on the goods market. Monetary targeting strategies were thereby set up in a number of countries following the monetarist Friedmanian argument against Keynesian views that central banks' intervention should also contribute to support the employment level, thereby reducing unemployment rates. And Friedman argued that there is a natural rate of unemployment be below which there is no possibility to reduce further un unemployment. And we can't, we shouldn't go beyond this so-called natural rate of unemployment because in this way we will increase inflationary pressures. Whereby Keynes said, no, th there is no natural magnitude, there is no natural rate of unemployment. And central banks' intervention should also aim at supporting activity, thereby employment levels, and not just looking at price stability on the goods market. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Freeman was known for one of his famous phrases that inflation was always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, with respect to endogenous money, uh, that will be discussed in another video on post Keynesian economics. Um, so the next question was going to be, what are the main uh, ideas of monetarism? You've uh, identified some of them. Uh, one of them, I think, is um, the notion of adaptive expectations with respect to the vertical Phillips curve. Um, how do expectations play in Friedman's views? Well, Friedman distinguished between the short term and the long term. Over the short run, according to Friedman, there might be a discrepancy between what agents expect to observe and what they actually observe. Thereby, there might be what he calls surprise inflation, a rate of increase in the price level that is much higher than agents have expected, have anticipated. But over the long run, as time goes by, Friedman said that agents do learn from their mistakes. And eventually, over the long run, agents are in a position to anticipate exactly what will occur and thereby they adapt their expectations. As time goes by, they learn from their mistakes. And eventually, there, there is no, if you want, Phillips curve trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Over the long run, the Phillips curve, according to Friedman, is vertical. Thereby, central bankers should not try to reduce unemployment. They should just focus on price level, on price stability on, on the goods market. And also, uh, as regards fiscal policy, Keynesian argument is that fiscal policy should support employment levels, should support economic activity, should perhaps be financed if there is a fiscal deficit by the so-called printing press, by a monetary policy expansion, whereby Friedman said, no, it is impossible to, to influence real magnitudes like employment or unemployment levels with monetary policy decisions. And those decisions should aim at price stability to inform agents' expectations in order to avoid there is a higher, higher and higher level of inflation, a hyperinflation or a stagflation period, whereby inflation increases, but unemployment is not reduced. And fiscal policy should aim at balancing the public sector's budget. And in this way, we should reduce public expenditure instead of increasing taxation. If there is an economic crisis, the public sector should balance its own budget. And if it collects lower tax, income, it should reduce public expenditure instead of having a counter-cyclical fiscal policy, as Keynes argued, 
if the public sector increases its own spending when the private sector is depressed, this will support and kickstart economic growth. But eventually, Keynes pointed out, the public sector's debt should be repaid, not by reducing the tax rates, but by getting more tax income if there is an increase in economic activity. Um, you mentioned in, in a previous answer uh, uh, the role of money supply and monetary policy. Why do you think monetarism resonated so well with, with central banks? I mean, there was this period where many central banks in the early 80s experimented with monetarism. What, why, why, why did central banks find monetarism so attractive? Well, um, perhaps because of two reasons. On the one hand, uh, after the so-called glorious thirties, at the end of this period, we observed what Friedman himself called stagflation, namely an expansion of monetary and fiscal policy that were unable to address unemployment problems. The rate of increase in the price level was higher and higher. Public sector spending increased, increase in public sector debt, but the rate of employment did increase and unemployment were quite problematic. So Keynesian policies were not in a position at the time to address these issues properly. And central bankers were in a sense uh, attacked by a number of stakeholders saying, you see, if there is a higher and higher price level, this is because central banks have been inflating the so-called money supply as a result of the fact that they were run, running the printing press to pay for the public status deficit. And on the other hand, of course, central bankers were already part of the so-called elite, the financial elite. There is also the issue of revolving doors. The CEO of a giant bank might then become the, the Fed president or the opposite. So there is a private interest in this financial elite that aims at reducing inflation because inflation affects the wealthy much more than the poor people. So both private interest and the public sector's action was in a, were in a sense pushing a, across the line and namely central bankers were happy that monetarists were in fashion were the dominant school of economic thought at the time because this was meant to allow central bankers to focus on price stability on the goods market only, getting, re getting rid of political pressure because central banks became independent as a result of this counter-revolution that Friedman initiated. Um. So we, we know, thank you, we know of the, the, the monetarist experimentation in the 80s. What was the result? Was monetarism a success? Well, I wouldn't say it was a success, even though apparently it contributed to reducing the higher and higher rate of inflation observed before monetarists came in fashion. In fact, uh, the result of this apparent success is due to the fact that owing to the neoliberal school of thought owing to monetarist and so forth. Uh, th there has been, for several reasons, a reduction in the wage share and therefore a reduction in the upper pressure on the price level on the goods market because if consumers as wage earners have a lower purchasing power, there will be a lower demand on the goods market and therefore the inflationary pressure on this market is not revealed anymore. If the public sector is obliged to, re to rebalance its own budget, to cut public spending because it doesn't want to increase taxation income, then eventually both the private sector consumption and the public sector demand on the goods market are reduced so that it is for certain, for sure, that there is no increase in the price level, even though this might be then apparently the merit of central banks having become independent owing to monetarism. But if we look at the monetary strategy that Friedman proposed, namely monetary targeting, in Switzerland, as well as abroad, in, as regards my own perspective, we observe that central banks adopting such a Friedmanian strategy have not been in a position to achieve the monetary target they have been announcing. In Switzerland, they have been announcing, for instance, a rate of growth for M1 close to 1% yearly, but then M1 was much higher, was growing much more than 1% yearly, even though eventually the rate of inflation was more or less stable over time and close to 2%. So uh, the, the instrument, the strategy was not working well, but eventually the result was there. Inflation was under control, but for other reasons than monetarism. I completely agree. So let's be clear. Do you think central banks can control the growth of any monetary aggregates? 
No, this is a figment of the monetarist imagination. Monetarists like Friedman argued that there is a so-called money multiplier. Therefore, central banks issue money, central bank money in the form of bank notes, if you want, or in the form of what they call reserves, namely settlement balances that banks have with the central bank. And then through the so-called monetary circulation, banks do multiply this monetary basis via the credit mechanism they grant to any kinds of agents. And eventually, there is the money supply, which is a higher number of money units than the central bank money has been created. But in fact, we observe, like also post Canadians did, that there is a credit divisor, in fact. Money is not exogenous. It doesn't fall from the sky, from what Freeman used to call the helicopter. But it is the result of the credit lines that banks have been opening to any kinds of borrowers. If banks provide a credit line to an agent, the agent draws on this line to pay some bill, and the payee receives a claim on a bank deposit, which inflates the so-called money supply. But in fact, this is the result of an endogenous mechanism of the needs of trade, one could say, or of the needs of finance nowadays. So eventually, uh, monetarism is, died, is dead because we notice that central banks, the, the Bank of England, the Bundesbank, the Swiss National Bank have been publishing since 2000. 2007 reports whereby they explain the money creation mechanism as an endogenous mechanism, even though they still think that there might be any helicopter money as the QE for uh, a number of years have been trying to convince us. QE means quantitative easing policies, namely the increase in the so-called central bank money as a result of the financial crisis that has erupted in 2008 at global level, but we noticed that all this central bank money has not been flowing into the real, so-called real economy, but has been turning around and circulating rapidly across financial markets. So asset, mar asset prices have inflated as a result of these QE monetary policy decisions, but the real sector has been suffering from low employment levels, from high uh, unemployment rates, and thereby economic activity has been reduced and not expanded. So this is a good segment, uh, a good way to segment into the last question. Um, it's been 30 years or so, three, three and a half decades. Uh, what's left of monetarism today? Well, I think there are two levels to address this question. At the academic level, monetarism is still in fashion. A number of economics professors, the majority of them, I think, across the Western countries, but also elsewhere, they do believe that money is the result of a central bank decision, that the money multiplier is still alive and kicking, that the central bank should still try to focus and to target the price stability goal, especially in the goods market, ignoring other asset prices, namely real estate prices, but also financial prices, namely also ignoring financial instability issues. And at the economic policy level, this perspective is still alive and kicking in Switzerland, in Europe, I think also in the United States, the idea that uh, the central bank might increase the money supply di directly or indirectly, thereby affecting the market rates of interest in order to especially in the United States, but also in Europe, to support investment by firms and thereby increase employment levels and economic activity. But I always argue and explain to my students that if the central bank policy rates of interest are reduced, in Switzerland they are even negative, this is not enough in order for firms to increase their investment if the so-called effective demand, Keynes expression, is not there. If firms are not expecting to sell more output, they are not going to invest to produce more output, they are not going to hire more people, more workers, because there is a lack in effective demand. So instead of reducing the policy rates of interest, central banks should perhaps support economic activity by purchasing government bonds on the primary market. But this, in a number of countries, is forbidden because it would otherwise finance by the so-called printing press, the public sector's deficit, and in monetarist fashion, this will increase the press level and create inflationary pressures, whereby this is not what occurs today, because the idea that if you increase the money supply, you eventually increase the price level by the same proportion is based on the hidden assumption that there is a full employment situation, 
whereby nowadays there is a lack of full employment. We have an underemployment situation. We have involuntary unemployment. And so if there is an increase in public spending, there will be a higher demand on the goods market and firms might perhaps increase the employment level because there is a so-called army of reserve, namely a number of num people uh, willing and able to work, but uh, still unemployed that could get a job, get a salary and thereby increase their consumption expenditures in support of all economic activity. Sergio Rossi, thank you very much for sitting down with me, taking the time. Um, a wonderful interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louis Philippe, for your stimulating questions. Thank you for all. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Bye.